Welcome back to the Fred Harrison podcast series. Picking up from where we left off, Fred published The Power in the Land, where he demonstrated how land values move in 18-year cycles and how the work of Henry George would eliminate the damage done by these speculative booms and busts. In The Corruption of Economics, published a decade later, with Mason Gaffney, he showed how the superior economic theory was systematically attacked by economists in favour of theories that suited landowners who wanted to be free to ride on the work of others. In this next section, Fred explains what we could build if we applied the theories of Henry George in society. Society is riven with so many problems, mental, sociological, the climate and so on. But all of these are linked by the injustice of uh, the way national income is divided. And the way to resolve these problems simultaneously, organically, not by high-minded uh, actions by government, is for people's behavior to begin to change in an organic way. And that means that they authorize the uh, reduction in the taxes that are imposed on their productive efforts, on their wages and their savings. But correspondingly, they say, we agree to pool into the public purse the rents that we're already paying, that we're willing to pay. When we negotiate a price for a location where we want to live, the price of a house, we are saying, we will pay so much for that location. The only problem is we're giving the value that we're offering out of our next 25 or 30 years labor to the wrong person. The value of the location, not the dwelling itself, but the location belongs to the community that provides the transport systems that we want to use, uh, the entertainment facilities, the access to schools and hospitals, those are the things that give the location its value and we should be saying as individuals, we will pay that location value, the rent, into the public purse to fund those public services in exchange for which government reduces the taxes on our wages or our savings and investments so that we end up with a balanced system where as individuals, we are behaving responsibly. It does come down to personal responsibility. Uh, but we are funding the services that we want. It's not the government that's doing this. We take control of the funding process. We identify the services we want and we'll pay for them. Uh, so we can't blame anyone else if we are not getting the services that we want. Uh, we can take the credit for funding the services that we say we need to share in common. It's that one decision to agree to rebalance the financial system and that's at the individual personal level of saying we want to uh, simultaneously shift the the revenue system off our earned income in exchange for which we will contribute the location rents for our local business or our factory or our home we will use those location rents put pooling them to pay for the services that we want the first settlers create the community uh, and for that they're entitled to be rewarded, uh, but the incomers after them also add value to the community. The first settlers were entitled to be paid for the, the labor input into those communities. They weren't entitled to the value of the land that was there originally before them, over which they had no exclusive right of ownership. Uh, and they never did gain private ownership over the communal assets that uh, have to be uh, renewed and expanded all the time by the uh, second and third generation settlers. So 
the, the only way to create a sustainable community is to pool the rents that are continuously being created by the first set settlers, the third, uh, the fifth generation incomers, uh, while freeing people to benefit from their individual contributions through their wages and their savings, which ought not to be taxed. Uh, so that there is this equity, this fairness about the mechanism for creating and expanding uh, a community. That does not exist today. So if we want to rehabilitate communities in, in uh, the regions, uh, it ought to be on the basis of the legacy assets that have accumulated over many genera generations, in fact over centuries, do not belong to the current people who occupy those far-flung communities. They belong to everybody. Uh, the newcomers that might start to go back and who ought to be going back to those settlements so as to renew them and expand them, drawing people away from the slums in the conurbations of the Midlands and uh, London and Manchester, uh, that model of growth ought to be based on let's expand the shared assets of the community. We can measure the annual value of those assets. It's called rent. Uh, the more any individual adds by way of his labor and ingenuity, he doesn't get penalized, taxed for doing that. And there is a mutual benefit for everybody. And then we can start to rebuild uh, the communities that have been gutted over the last 500 years. So the world needs to rehabilitate the old communities. Uh, instead of creating wild west communities in uh, desolate, far-flung places, we now need to reverse the process draw people back to the ancient communities and start to renew them. And this time we get it right by sim the simple formula that insofar as you add value through your labor or your savings, you keep that. You don't, you don't get penalized with a tax on them. But by using the local services and assets, including nature's, uh, you pull that value into the common public purse and therefore you get the right to live in the, the locality and enjoy what becomes a sustainable community. We can see that this model of renewal actually works and has happened. If we point to Singapore or Taiwan or Hong Kong, those communities were ancient, uh, they were colonized, uh, they were deprived, and then through a quirk in history, a change occurred and they started to um, pool the rents. And what happened in Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Singapore? They exploded. They flourished. And now, a country like Britain, a government in Britain, wants to create a Singapore on Thames. We are wanting to copy those examples. But those are examples where uh, they renewed themselves because, for whatever reason, and they, these are documented in the Shepherd Walwyn books, they started drawing the rents and using those rents to fund public services. And that created a dynamic community. And that's an example of renewal that could happen anywhere in the world, whether it's the slums of Cape Town uh, or on the edges of Glasgow. We can begin to create that renewal, that flourishing, by the one simple device of rebouncing the public revenue. The mistake that we've made over basically the last hundred years 
uh, in advocating tax reform is to assume that people could see the grand vision that lay behind the idea of rearranging government revenue to cut taxes on their earned incomes and raise the revenue from what is a socially created stream of income, which is rent. Everybody who's been imbued with this idea has uh, been entranced by the vision of an organic transformation of society, but they've left much of that unsaid. So the mistake that we made, and that includes me over a period of something like 40 years, when I've gone to uh, politicians uh, or think tanks and advocated uh, the need for a change in the tax regime on the grounds that that's both efficient and fair, we haven't laid out all the related issues. We've just taken it for granted that people would grasp the justice of, of what was being said and would understand the total transformation, the organic transformation in society that would flow. And that was a mistake because it allowed uh, the vested interests to narrow the conversation to just the economics of it and then to dismiss it as either it doesn't work or it wouldn't raise enough revenue or uh, let's just forget it anyway because it's too much trouble and there are other things to deal with. And we've always gone away from meetings with members of parliament and so on wondering why is it that they didn't grasp the full beauty of what we were advocating. And then at the beginning of the 21st century, it began to dawn on me that we weren't making explicit the systemic change that would arise and the uh, human uh, benefits of the change. So it's, the issue is not confined just to the economics. It's, uh, it alters the fabric of communities and the psychology of individual people. Uh, and so from the beginning of uh, this century, I began to elaborate on the wider issues, working towards a more comprehensive account of what follows by the one uh, initiative of rearranging the way government raises its revenue. After some several decades of uh, advocating the abstract theory, it, it, uh, everybody becomes uh, aware of the human costs of the current system uh, and the historical origins uh, of the crime that was committed. Uh, an example is the way in which religion was neutralized. Going back to Henry VIII, he not only grabbed the land that belonged to the monasteries, he had to neutralize religion, which was an alternative source of authority for the people. Uh, if they can invoke uh, their spiritual sensibilities against the state's behavior, then they can, by posing uh, an opposition to what the crown, the king, or Parliament was doing because they can refer to an alternative authority, they could uh, balance the power, the might of the state with their own conviction that there is something wrong and it had to be put right. So Henry VIII neutralized that capacity that had been evolved by human beings, the spiritual sensibilities. Uh, he neutralized that uh, independent source of authority by turning the church into the official organ of the state. He placed himself at the head of the Church of England and now that voice that might have come from the church on behalf of the people was neutralized uh, and that damaged the, the uh, essence of what it means to be human beings uh, because they, they couldn't now refer to their religious teachings and use the authority of uh, the, the scriptures against the politicians. 
that was just one of the crimes against humanity. And eventually, uh, by uh, uh, campaigning to explain the theory of economics, one begins to realize how deep, how deeply penetrating the injustice has become. Uh, and yes, the, there was a point where I stopped being just an objective uh, reporter of the facts and decided I needed to advocate. Uh, and um, uh, the experience of writing books like The Corruption of Economics and working in a country like Russia uh, may sensitized oneself to uh, the grotesque injustices that exist in our society and how easy it would be to remove them just by uh, a transitional change in the way governments raise their revenue. It's that simple. But it's not enough just to describe it as a simple process because unless people really understand the depth of the deprivation that people suffer as individuals and as communities, then they're just going to think, well, he's just talking about another tax. So, well, why bother? One outcome today is they talk about the need for a wealth tax. Well, a wealth tax, but people earn wealth. Why are we not discriminating between wealth that's earned and wealth that's not earned? Uh, because if you just tax wealth, uh, you hit the objections that are uh, produced by the experts. Oh, you can't really tax wealth because the wealthy people would just go abroad and they would take their money with them. Uh, and so you can't raise the tax rate on wealth too high because you don't uh, uh, raise much revenue for government. These are fatuous arguments based on uh, the failure to define wealth in a way that focuses policy forensically on the correct source of wealth that needs to be taxed. So in all the debates currently about the need to tax wealth, nobody says, but hang on, there is one form of wealth they can't take abroad. They can't take land with them can't hide their land in, in a, a tax haven. A wealthy person may not want to pay a, a public charge on the valuable land he owns. He can go and live in the south of France, but he can't take the land with him and he can't hide the value that he's getting out of that land. So that is a form of wealth tax that they can't escape. But there's no discussion of that kind because the, the, the definition of wealth is so loose that it allows the people who want to defend the status quo to wriggle and uh, just create the smoke and mirrors that deter the politicians from making the right choices. So there's, a, there's an element there that, that we're not clear enough in, in what we're saying, or as, as people who want to engage in that conversation, we're not, we're not offering a clearer definition of, of wealth and which type of wealth we mean. But I also, you've written quite a lot about the way in which the, um, the, the predators, as you, as you describe them, have actually changed the debate to take a, make it impossible to discuss stuff. For example, the way in which they've changed the word rent, or actually they've taken land out of economics, which is what the corruption of economics was all about. Mm. Um, so I'm wondering if you wanted to talk about the way in which that that's, that the debate has been um, has been, you know, essentially made it not impossible, but just made much more difficult because there's, you know, there's been a deliberate um, muddying of terms and, yeah. and, and corruption of, of the language. Economics as a uh, academic discipline has been prejudiced by the failure to stick with the classical economic terms, uh, namely land, uh, capital, labor, wages, the basic definitions which serve all purposes and lead to clarity in understanding of both how the market economy works and how good government could operate uh, by 
subordinating land into capital, which is one of the devices employed by uh, the apologists uh, who defended rent-seeking at the end of the 19th, the beginning of the 20th century, by subordinating land into capital, the debate now is all about taxing capital, for example, which is penalizing people who actually work to create the capital to produce the goods that people want to exchange in the markets. So now, today, uh, opponents of change will say, but governments that tax capital are uh, depriving people of employment, which is correct, that's what happens. But what those apologists won't do is allow a careful distinction between taxing land and taxing other uh, resources, capital, infrastructure, uh, equipment, and so on. And so the whole debate is a muddle. And that is an intentional outcome of those who wanted to protect the behavior that we call free riding. Uh, so government policy now is just a shambles. But nobody understands why it's a shambles. People have become um, distrustful of politicians. They are unhappy with uh, policy making, but they don't know why. What is at the basis of it? So they end up thinking, oh, it must just be politicians who are uh, self-serving, uh, who are in it for themselves. But that I've come to realize that that's just not true. Most politicians are genuinely wanting to do the right thing by their constituents. But they don't understand what would be the right thing to do because they don't have the analytical uh, framework in their minds that explains that some policies, instead of actually helping their constituents, will make things worse. And that's the case today with Boris Johnson talking about levelling up the communities in the north of England. He probably believes that by spending a lot of money on infrastructure in the north, that will help the people of the north to raise living standards and raise uh, the quality of their lives. But on the contrary, it will make things even worse for a large number of people. But he doesn't understand why, and he's not told why that's the case. And the Treasury is full of economists who remain utterly silent. So, for instance, take the case of land. Land is unique compared with capital equipment. The technical concept is elasticity. You can tax land and there's nothing that the owner can do about it because um, the value won't disappear. Uh, it can't be removed to a tax haven uh, and therefore it is utterly uh, exposed to public gaze and not capable of being manipulated in the way that one can do with uh, capital that's been shaped by human beings, either equipment or in its monetary form, and hidden away from the tax authorities. But that distinction is just not part of the debate uh, in uh, government, and the Treasury doesn't use it to try and formulate uh, the policies that would actually achieve the goals that the government claims it wants to realise. Uh, but they know what the facts are, and uh, uh, there are times when people from within Whitehall will actually admit the reality, but those admissions are then sh shoved aside. It's an outrage. It's one of the scandals of which there are many. Uh, the, we have quotations from senior civil servants in the Treasury or the, the tax office who acknowledge that the most effective way to raise revenue is from the rent, we say, of the rent of land. But it's not just the rent of land, it's the rent of society as well as land. Rent is a composite value. It's a value that's created by the contribution of the services of nature and of society and of all of us working together. So that there are people in the Treasury and the Tax Office, topmost civil servants, 
who understand the reality, but they don't stick their heads above the parapet because they know they'll get shot at. They're not allowed to talk about the reality. And so government continues to be a shambles. And the politicians, the, pro the ministers who are supposed to formulate and implement uh, policies, continue to do so in pure ignorance of what they're actually doing. They don't realize that they are actually damaging their constituents' welfare because the knowledge that they need is just kept away from them. Thank you for listening to episode two in the Fred Harrison podcast series. In the next one, what we're going to look at is when Fred transitions from being an author who is an economist to a campaigning economist, where he goes to Russia to have influenced the Russian government as they transition to a market economy, and also back home when he attempts, sadly unsuccessfully, to influence the Blair government and the Treasury led by Gordon Brown. We'll see you then.